abandoned by a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisa were on their way from the land. Elijah said to Elisa, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisa said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisa and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisa, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Eliza and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. The word of the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. The second lesson is from 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who has let light shine upon the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore. 
Lord, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, any story that begins with a sentence like that, I think you know you're in for a great, exciting tale. The Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a great whirlwind. The first half of the first sentence of this Old Testament reading, we, we know that we're probably out of the realm of normal people, and we're into the realm of heroes and mythic warriors and prophets and kings. Only a few words into it, and we know that we're in a tale of, of greatness, one that will include waters parting and mantles being passed, and yes, even fiery chariots. We know that we're in for a story about God's phenomenal love for God's people. We can tell right at the very beginning of this Old Testament lesson. The readings of the church, also known as the lectionary, they provide very little time for us to get to know this man, Elijah, who is about to be taken up into, into heaven. In fact, this is pretty much it. This is pretty much all we get. His days as a prophet are finished, and his uh, spectacular send-off is narrated in today's words. And there's much to get to know about Elijah, how, for instance, he faced off with kings and queens, including the notorious Jezebel, and how also by daring acts and Miraculous demonstrations, he put legions of the prophets of Baal to rest. And yet there are elements of this passage that also take us into a different direction as, as well. The place the story uh, gives us about the real human Elijah. The, the words of the story, they provide us with an intimate glimpse into the relationship between this, this great prophet, yet this fading prophet, and his mentee, his apprentice, Elisha. Details such as this one, in, where the words in verse 3 give us, the company of prophets came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you not know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And Elisha said, yes, I know. Keep quiet. Keep, keep silent. Elisha's response betrays the emotion of parting that is too painful. Yet, to speak aloud, Elisha says that's too much. It's too much for him to hear about it or to have anybody speak about Elijah's departure. So just remain silent. So I think there's also in this story, we tend to be kind of drawn into the fiery chariots and the, and the horses, but there's a real human side to this story as well. There's a human core to this flashy, miraculous tale of Elijah's ascension into a whirlwind. And it comes with this relationship that Elijah has with Elisha. It is, after all, the story of a journey, the story of Elijah and Elisha's journey and the work that they are doing together, two men on a journey together, and they know that the journey will end. They know that the end is coming for all purposes, with, of course, one of them dying. These are men who have challenged and will challenge kings and queens, men who have called down the power and wrath of God in stunning and violent displays of 
power in them. These were all true, but these men who are in the end just friends, these two, Elijah and Elisha, are friends, fellow servants of God, a mentor and a follower, and they're trying to figure out how to get through a very difficult time in their lives. And Elijah knows that it will be a difficult time for Elijah. And so when he's finally gone from Elijah, so he says three times, and I probably noticed that when Carol was reading the story, th three times throughout the chapter, Elijah says, stay here for the Lord has sent me somewhere else. Stay here for the Lord sent me to Bethel, or the Lord has sent me to Jericho, or the Lord has sent me to Jordan. These are places that you cannot go with me, Elijah. So... So stay here. Three times in verses 2 and verses 4 and verses 6, we get this same kind of repetitive Elijah telling to Elijah to stay where he's put. And of course, all he's really trying to do is to protect Elijah. Maybe to say, you know, the Lord has sent me where you cannot go. The Lord has sent me to places where you can't go with me. And Elijah just keeps making the same response also three times. As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. 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 Elijah tells to Elijah three times. You see, so in the end, it is a very real human story. Not just a, a flashy, miraculous story of fiery chariots and someone being ascended into heaven. The lectionary pairs this passage from 2 Kings with the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, that moment when he and his disciples are on the mountain, and suddenly the glory of the Lord shines through Jesus. And I think that's where this passage is pointing us this morning. Glimpses of the glory of God's phenomenal love shining through God's people. So is it possible that the glory of God shines through these simple, yet these stubborn words of commitment and presence of Elijah? As the Lord lives and as you live, I will never leave you. I wonder if the glory of God's phenomenal love is shining through those words of Elijah. I mean, this is the response of Elijah to his mentor's attempt, really just to get him to scram, just to, you know, get him to go away. But Elijah will not go away. He stays with Elijah. This is the response of one who knows that whatever may come, it's going to be hard. I will not forsake you. I will never leave you. We hear those words elsewhere in scriptures also. This is, of course, the response of the phenomenal love of God. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. This God who even in our darkest hour remains with us, abiding with us through all of life, no matter what may come. So is it possible that one of the most godly things that we can do is to stay with one another? Just like Elijah stayed with Elijah. When every rational argument points us into the direction of leaving, maybe the most godly thing that we can do is just to stay. To stay with those that we love. And no, let me be clear, I'm not talking about abusive relationships. I'm not talking about that at all, in which the danger is inherent in the relationship itself. I'm not advocating that anyone stay with an abuser. This movie, Fifty Shades of Grey, just came out this weekend. I don't know how many of you saw that. I haven't seen it. But I've read reviews of it. And perhaps that this movie 
is more of an abusive relationship than anything else. I'm not advocating that we stay, any of us, in abusive relationships. I'm talking about the hard work of accompanying one another through life's difficulties and through life's challenges and trials. I'm talking about the loving spouse who stays, who maintains vigil in the scary days before and after a difficult surgery or in the hard weeks and months at the end of life. I'm talking about the friend who is willing to listen to the hard story of a breakup of the marriage as it needs to be told and retold over and over again. I'm talking about the child who cares for the parent. I'm talking about the parent who cares for the child. Those people who stay through very difficult times expressing and maintaining their love for each other. That's what I'm talking about. Maybe the love of God shines through us in those moments when we stay with one another. When care demands just a little more of us than we think that we're capable of giving, yet we stay. We stay. And I'm talking about the ways in which we walk with one another when we don't know what's coming, but we know that it's going to be scary and we know that it's going to be very difficult. Is it possible that it is here where we see the very glory of God shining through in our human relationships when we stay with each other? Scripture is, after all, the story of our journeys. Our journeys with God and our journeys with each other. So after God takes Elijah for one last kind of fiery, crazy ride up into the heavens, we hear his successor, because the mantle has been passed, we hear Elijah crying out in what sounds like a mixture of awe and despair. He says, Father, Father, he cries. And then Elijah disappears from his side and he takes his garments in his hands and he, and he tears his garments apart. A sign of deep mourning and Incredible grief, mourning and grief of a beloved family member in whom he has shared a phenomenal love. And he picks up then Elijah's mantle and he taps the Jordan with it and he asks the question, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And then the waters part. The waters separate and he watches as the river parts and he walks across and Elijah is able to perform this sign, and it seems to me, because it, as it turns out, as it turns out, he does not have to carry on alone. The God of Elijah is with him. And God's phenomenal love is with him. The glory of God's phenomenal love shines through him, and the phenomenal love of God will shine through him in the chapters that come later, when he is caring for a starving widow and her family who are going through some hard days. And the phenomenal love of God shines through us when we bring an extra can of food or maybe make a donation to the food shelf or bring a box of oatmeal for the food shelf. That's when the phenomenal love of God shines through God's people because we know these are hard days. For some people. And then the phenomenal love of God shines through Elijah when he warms the body of a dead boy and he brings him back to life. And the phenomenal love of God shines through us when we warm the body of a struggling person who might be cold and we offer a donation of clothes or maybe offer a coat to somebody who is in need. The phenomenal love of God shines through Elijah when he heals Naaman, the leper, later on in 2 Kings. And the phenomenal love of God shines through us when we offer a healing word to someone who is discouraged. Elijah and Elijah, you and me, we are all God's phenomenal people, you see. Because we all have this capacity to let the phenomenal love of God shine through us, not in 
in miraculous things, but in very simple things, in staying with one another, being for one another, giving of ourselves, and giving to people who are in need, giving our acts of kindness, our acts of healing, our every act of love, so that this phenomenal love of God will be made known through our lives. May it be so. Amen.